Be careful. What, how do you avoid pride given those circumstances? All that I have is a gift of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, who regards you as superior? What do you have? Answer the question. What do you have that you did not receive? Where did your skill come from in basketball? Where did your smarts in math come from? Where did your gift with the English language so that you're the best in English? Where did that come from? What do you have that you did not receive? And... If you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? It's all from God. And so when you get a good grade on the test, don't say, ah, oh, that was, you know, eh, I didn't really. You did. What do you say? Thanks be to God. He gave me that ability. Glory to God who helped me to remember. Because everything you have, don't deny that you have it, but give the glory to God. Whether you have good looks, whether you, you know, that's an accident of genes. Whether you have brains, uh, that's, that's, again, God's gift. God made you that way. Whether you have strength and skill, as opposed to that other student in your class who's always sick, it's all from God. Give God glory. All right, so what is the command? Humility of mind. Now let's go back to Philippians 1, and I need to hasten on. What is this going to look like? How are you going to observe humility of mind in the church? What does it look like? Well, he tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Think of others as rising above you. Looking up to them. Give preference to one another in honor, Paul said, Romans 12.10. Okay, so honor them more than yourself. And maybe you say, well, wait a minute, you know, it's just not real. I am smarter than him. But, but I am better in basketball than, than that person. But I did get a better grade. How can I regard him as having the best grade when I got the best grade? Well, it's not talking about regarding him as having the better grade, if that's not the case, but more important. They are every bit as important, if not more so, than you. Who's number one? Muhammad Ali, I'm number one. Regard everybody else as number one and yourself as number two, three or four. Everyone as more important than yourself. Now, you know, uh, in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, I'm sure you've heard the words. Uh, Benjamin Franklin Thomas Jefferson put these words in there. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And you know the words, okay, even though you're not American citizens. Uh, you, you've heard them. Well, what is, is that true? Are all men created equal? Uh, obviously, Jefferson and Franklin were not fools. They did not mean equal in every sense. They meant equal in rights. But it's just a lie that we're all equal in every sense. I mean, some are smart and some are not. Some are healthy, some are sick. Some are tall, some are short. Some have long noses, some have short noses. And we're not the same. We're different. Praise God. We're not all like me, you know? <laughs> well, then what, how can I say they're more important when really I'm smarter or really I'm, I've, I've achieved, I'm the president of the company for crying out loud, you know? I'm top dog. So why should I regard them as more important? I mean, he's a lowly employee. I'm top dog. I'm the CEO. Top dog. That's not realistic. It doesn't work. Well, it does work in the church. Because here's how you do it. How you consider others more important than yourself. First of all, consider yourself. Who are you? Reality. Look in God's mirror. I'm a sinner. I have failed many times. And all I have is from God. And what do I deserve? 
Be honest with yourself in God's mirror. What do you deserve? You deserve hell as the bottom line. I went into a, uh, I'm, I don't know if I told you this story. I've used it as an illustration before someplace. But I went into an optician in the U.S. because my glasses were kind of foggy. I had been, I had, before I went home, I had sprayed some uh, uh, varnish on a, some, on a desk. And the wind took the spray and my glasses were all foggy. And so this optician looked at my glasses and he said, Oh, this is terrible. You deserve better than this. Huh? And he said, I deserve hell, man. <laughs> and you're saying I got glasses and I deserve better glasses? You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but that's the way the world is. You deserve. You're entitled. Dear young people, you know what you deserve? And, and get it straight. So, oh, what a negative thing to say to kids. But it's real. You deserve hell. And anything you have is grace. Common grace. Anything you receive is above and beyond. Look at yourself in reality. What I deserve is hell. And so how can I say I'm better than anybody else? Secondly, look at them. Maximize their good points. Okay? Okay. So this person maybe is not good in math, but maybe they're good in English, or maybe they're good in basketball. Look at their good points. Don't blow out of proportion their bad points. Minimize their bad points. And you'll begin to appreciate them more. Maximize your faults and minimize your good points. Because we tend to go the other way. And consider that person in the light of glory. If that person is saved, all right, look around the room here. You know, we're going to meet each other in glory, I hope. Yeah? Will we see each other in glory? I pray it's so for each one of you. But think about that person. Maybe you see them now and you say, oh man, what a cranky, miserable person. But just think, you know, when you get the glory, you're going to find out that that person you look down at, maybe they're going to have a higher seat in glory than you do. You know, I think this is really important for pastors and preachers. We think, well, we're up front, you know, we're doing all the work here, but we're not. I bet a lot of preachers are going to get to heaven, and they're going to find out the reason for the growth of their church and the blessing on their preaching is this widow that nobody notices, and she's been praying fervently. God heard her prayer. Nobody notices her. But you see, there are going to be some surprises in glory. And all those negative things that you put down that person for, they're not going to be there anymore. Think of glory. Fast forward and remember that potential. And what's the result? If you have a church, just think about this. You know, everybody here in this church thinks of everybody else as more important. You first. No, you first. No, you first. Sabi ko ikaw muna! No, hopefully we won't get to that. But you know, if everybody's putting others first, what do you have? Here I'll quote Lenski again. What's the result? A marvelous community in which no one is looked down upon, but everyone is looked up to. Think of that. No one is looked down upon. Walang hinahamak. Nobody, you know, eh, you're just there. But everybody, oh, good to see you again. Oh, I appreciate you. You know, if that's how everybody's treated, not falsely, not plastic, okay, of course, reality. Do you want to be part of a church like that? I do. That's like heaven on earth. But that's exactly what is talked about here now the one more thing that i'll mention just briefly is that going back to philippians chapter 2 that you are to consider their things literally as important as your own literally not the things of your own each one looking to but the things of each other now when it says look at the things of others as as <coughs> excuse me uh the thing you consider first uh, that, you know, the things. Well, that could be their possessions. 
And we're very careful about our own possessions. And we take care, okay, that's my ball pen, huh? Don't, don't forget. Uh, are you as careful about the things about, that's my cell phone, huh? Don't drop it. Are you as careful about the things of others, possessions? And how about their burdens? Consider their burdens as important as your burdens. You know, sometimes we come to church and we're thinking, Ay, grabe, ang bigat. You know, I have such a problem and, and, and we're so self-pitying. And we exalt, we blow up our big burden. And we think everybody should notice me, everybody should stroke me, everybody should pay attention to me. But here's this brother over here, this sister over there that has a much bigger problem. And here's the point. Don't look at your own burden. Look how you can help the burden of others. That's the, an application. What's it going to look like? Another thing would be the things of others. What things? The joys. You know, somebody comes into the Sunday gathering and, and they're filled with joy and they have received some blessing. Maybe they got promoted at work or maybe they got the best grade on the test or maybe they're valedictorian and, and all of these things. And you think, Bakit siya? Why, did, why was he given it? Why didn't I get it? And you're thinking of yourself so think of their joys and is more important than yours and so you rejoice with those who rejoice as well as weep with those who weep and you see if we have a church like that where everybody's considering everybody else's things whatever it may be as more important than yourself what a blessing to be part of a church like this now What's the application of Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4? First of all, this is true body life. You know, there are some churches, they try to manufacture body life. Okay, we're going to assign everybody to a small group, one, two, three. I'm not saying that's a terrible thing to have small groups in your church. But sometimes by trying to manufacture or force body life, it just fails. All right, we have this group. We have in, in college, we called them family groups or whatever you want to call them, uh, D group, G group, or whatever. Uh, we can't manufacture it. But where you have a church where Philippians 2, 1 to 4 is obeyed, you're going to have body life. And where does it come from? It comes from union with Christ. It comes because you're renewed. And you're following the footsteps of Jesus. Second thing, maybe I'm talking to some here who have been exalting yourselves like Diotrephes. Maybe, you, maybe you've been thinking like the frog, I'm bigger than him. I'm bigger than her. I'm better. I'm more important. I'm more gifted. I can do it better. Have you? Where does that thought come from? You can be like God. You can be better than you are. You can be the best. You deserve better. Comes from Satan. Send it back to the pit. With humility of mind. Humble yourselves, Peter wrote under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time. Have you been thinking, oh, I'm not getting what I deserve in this church. I'm going to go to another church. Then they'll notice my gift. They'll notice that I'm really smart. Have you been thinking like that? Paul says, nothing from empty conceit and selfish ambition put it away and humble yourself even way back in the old testament jeremiah had to say to his scribe are you thinking of great things for yourself seek them not god said through jeremiah don't seek great things seek yes to be a humble servant in the church of christ use your gifts for god's glory but give him all the glory 
humility of mind. Now, dear friend, as we close this morning, remember what we read in Habakkuk 2.4. As for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. The society around us is sick. Because society is motivated by this proud thought, I am better, I deserve, I am entitled to all of these things. That's what we hear in society. That's the chorus of this age. Dear friend, your heart is proud within you. And it's not right. And you know it's not right. God's given you a conscience that is screaming. Maybe you try to hush it up. It's not right. It's not right. How can you be cured? Well, he's going to go on, and we read verse 5. Have this mind, this attitude, which was in Christ Jesus. What did he do? He humbled himself. He's God. He humbled himself. Not by leaving aside Godhead, but by taking upon himself manhood to the point of the cross. Why the cross? To pay for the sin of pride, among other sins. For everyone who comes to him in faith, the righteous shall live, shall live true life by is faith. Come to this Jesus and trust in Him and cry to Him, Oh Lord Jesus, take this filthy, proud heart of mine and mind of mine and wash it and cleanse it and flush it out of me and help me to be a lowly servant that gives glory to Your name. With every breath I take, with every word I say, with every deed I do, Oh Lord, may You be glorified. God, can take your proud heart and do that for you. That's his business. Come to him. Plead with him. And he will hear. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done in Jesus, how you can take proud, cocky sinners full of themselves and their miserable achievements and their lowly activities and show them what they are in reality. And then you can take them and exalt them and lift them up and change them and wash them and cleanse them and make them new and give them a new heart and a new song and a new life. And oh God, we plead you would do that for our friends who are with us here this morning. And for your people, we ask, oh God, that you would further the work of sanctification and help us to put aside anything that has to do with selfish ambition and vain glory and with lowliness of mind to consider others more important than ourselves. Help us, O oh God, to live this passage day by day and to glorify you, not merely with our coming to church, but with our lives, our words, our thoughts. So we ask these mercies because you're a merciful, gracious God. We know that you hear our cry. In Jesus' name, amen.